Sing praises to the Lord, all you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Please rise as we sing together hymn 21, as with gladness of medical, hymn number 21.
kneeling before our God. And let us pray together. God, our Heavenly Father, we confess to you that we have surely sinned against you. God, for the word of thee, not only in our transgressions, but also in secret thoughts and desires, that we are unable fully to understand. But we are all known to you. We are in need of deliverance from your enemies and our infirmities. For this reason, we need our refuge. Amen and amen. Please stand and lift up your heads to hear the good news, which this morning comes to us from Romans chapter 5, verse 9, where it says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We, the people of God, are presently justified, that is declared right, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we await our final justification at the final day of glorification. Guaranteed by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and our inheritance in the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what you feel, but what matters is what the Word of God declares. Therefore, as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you, the people of God, that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right to do so. Truly, it is fitting, right, and beneficial to give thanks at all times and in every place. O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, therefore the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, and with the church on earth, we praise and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall be radiant afar, your daughter shall be carried upon the hip. Your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold 
and frankincense, and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you have heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery, hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose <coughs> that what he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise and respect for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel text is Matthew chapter 2. Verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to you, o Christ.
This is the first Sunday in the season of Epiphany. And Epiphany is not just a funny word, it means a sudden appearing. And our text this first Sunday morning of the season of Epiphany is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us this morning. Open our eyes again to see the epiphany of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray by the power of the Spirit, you would cause us to have application in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We went intertubing on the Smith River up in Northern California, and the water was great, but the water was shallow, and the river bottom was all stones, little stones, about one to two feet across. After riding the tubes down the river, you had to walk the tube back upstream, and with bare feet, it was ponderous and painful. It was a long road back. After the fall, God began to bring mankind back to himself, first with the patriarchs, and through them, the Israelites, and finally, at the end of the day, the Lord brings the Gentiles in. This morning, the Gospel of Matthew shows us the long road back. The long road back. Go ahead and open up your Bibles. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And it starts off there in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1 by saying this. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now these wise men here in the Greek are called magi. We'll take a look at who they are in just a second. But notice that they arrive after a long road trip looking for the king of the Jews. That's who they say they're looking for when they come to Jerusalem. Now they're likely from Persia, what's now the Parthian Empire. And at the center of that is still the city of Babylon, which was a center of learning. And these are magi, they're not magicians, they're wise advisors to kings. They're men who study literature, they're men who study history. There are many who study science. There are astronomers who watch the stars for signs and seasons. And I believe that their lineage in Babylon goes all the way back even through Jewish magi. You may remember there were Jewish magi, right? Remember them? Remember Daniel and his friends? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And because of this, Jewish magis have become very influential first in the Babylonian Empire and later in the Persian Empire. And I believe the scriptures had been taught and carried through this tradition of these magis. And suddenly they show up here in Jerusalem in these days and they say, where is the king of the Jews? What star are they talking about? And why have they shown up at this very moment in time? Well, like I said, I believe they had access to the prophecies of Daniel. They had access to the Old Testament. They were studying the Word of God. And I believe that they were looking at Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks. And they pinpointed a rough date on when something big is about to happen. And that big thing is the appearance of a star, an announcement of the coming of this great king. Now where did the star come from? If you got a Bible and you got a second there, this is kind of fascinating. Turn in Numbers chapter 24 to verse 17. Numbers 24, verse 17. Because I believe that this is where the star comes from. This is what they are accessing. It's not coming out of their heads. They're not getting strange impressions by God. But rather, they're looking at the scripture itself, and they see this from the law of God. In Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, it says this. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also his enemies shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of cities. Here we've got a prophecy so long ago about a star, a kok in the Hebrew, that's going to come. And with it comes a star from Jacob and a scepter rising out of Israel. King will come out of Israel. Edom shall be dispossessed. And here's where it gets fascinating. Do you know who made this prophecy? 
Take a look. If you go back up to verse 15, you'll find out who this is. Verse 15, and he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. Balaam, a false prophet, who was hired to bring down curses upon Israel in the days of Moses. Balaam, this man who, who tells the people of Midian to use their daughters to lead the sons of Israel astray. And yet God moves upon him. God will do what God will do. God will move upon false prophets and put his true words in their mouths. And so we see this true prophecy coming forth from Balaam, going down through the centuries through these wise men. It's been 1,600 years since these words were uttered by Balaam by the time of Christ. 1,600 years. 1,600 years ago, friends, the Roman Empire was still standing. It was a long road to Messiah. Going on to verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Now Herod, it's important for us to be reminded, called himself king of the Jews. Now he tried to observe some forms of Jewish practice, but he wasn't actually a Jew. He was Idumean. He was from the country of Idumea. Idumea. You know what Idumea is? It's Edom Mea, Edom Mea. It's the country of Edom. Edom in the Hebrew means red. Edom is the Hebrew word that was used to describe Esau. He was red colored apparently. And so from that time forth, Edom, the people of Esau, were called the Edomites. Edomea is the country of Edom. And we see that Herod is actually a son of Edom. He's actually the new Esau. This harkens back to the great and titanic struggle that we see again and again throughout the Bible. The struggle between Jacob and Esau. They wrestled together in the womb. They struggled together in their lives in order to see who would have the birthright. The descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau struggled in the days when the Israelites came into the land. And that struggle goes forward today. Herod, a descendant of Esau, represents the world and Jesus is the son of Jacob, ultimately the true Jacob. And we see here that Herod is troubled. Herod is a vicious, violent king who has no problem killing his own family members when he feels that they're trying to seize power from him. And so the whole city is troubled when Herod is troubled. A righteous king would not be troubled. A righteous king would see and bow the knee before the true king. Going on to verse 4 and assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. Now notice here, you should take some time when you're reading the Bible, look for little clues of things. Look for subtle differences of things. Now you notice here that when the Magi come, they say, we want to come and see the king of the Jews. We want to worship him. But notice how Herod says it. He calls him the Christ. He acknowledges that the idea of the king of the Jews is interconnected with the Christ, the Messiah. And here he inquires of his religious leaders as to the place where Messiah is to come from. The precise place is the city of David. Bethlehem, and this comes from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Let's go on to verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring word to me that I too may come and worship him. Now Herod, notice here, brings the Magi in secretly. See that? First he has his religious rulers come in and he inquires the place where Messiah is to come from. Then he brings the Magi back secretly. Why did he bring them back secretly? Because he knew that the chief priests and the scribes believed the prophecies. And they would have protected the Christ. Because these religious leaders know who Herod is and they know what he is capable of. Now notice what we have here with Herod. Herod has the exact location via the scripture. 
Bethlehem, the city of David. And now he has the timing. Notice the timing. They asked him, when did you first see the star? Now we get the idea, right? The star goes up and then it leads them all along the way day after day. But that's not what the text says. I think what happened is the star appeared and they knew that the time had arrived. They kind of knew the generalized timing as they were reading the scriptures back wherever they came from. They're watching the heavens and then this miraculous star appears and they know from the scripture, go to Jerusalem. Go to Jerusalem and inquire of this king of the Jews. And from that timing, now Herod knows when Jesus was born. That's why he knows the age of the children that he's going to slaughter in the slaughter of the innocents. He is bent on opposing God and killing the Christ. Think about this for a minute. The depths of the sin of this man. He knows Messiah is coming in Bethlehem. He knows the timing of Messiah's coming. He's got these strange wise men, probably with a large retinue, coming from who knows where, looking for the king of the Jews. You would think he would go, what's going on? What's God doing? But the first thing he wants to do is kill the Christ. Going on to verse 9. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It seems that the star appeared when Jesus was born. And now as they travel to Jerusalem, they see the star once again, this time leading them a day's journey over to Bethlehem. It comes to right the exact spot where Jesus is. And they rejoice with great and exceeding joy. There must have been some time between the star's first appearance and their arrival in Jerusalem. I believe that Jesus is now an infant. It's not that he was just born like we see oftentimes in the storybooks. He may be up to two years old. That's the age that Herod begins to kill the children down from. But they looked and they were watching the heavens. And then they had to get their stuff together. And they needed to go to their king and get an edict. And they needed to bring their retinue from far away to Jerusalem and finally to Bethlehem. It was a long road there. And the star guided them to the exact house. Now, what was the star? You know, someone said it might have been some sort of a comet. I don't know. Was it some sort of miraculous appearance of an angel? We don't know. It's a mystery. But the star appeared, and it appeared again, and it took the wise men right to the exact house where Jesus was. Verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him, then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The Magi worshipped Jesus. The Magi fell down and worshipped Jesus. The law tells us not to bow down and to worship anything in this world. And we know that people of God know from one end of the scripture to the other, you don't bow down and worship men. You don't bow down and worship angels. You bow down and you worship the true and living God. And the Magi worship Jesus. They open their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Expensive gifts. I believe in some maximum quantity of some sort. And this explains how Joseph and Mary and Jesus are able to go down for an extensive period of time down into Egypt and to survive. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, there's one place in the Bible where these three elements come together. There's one place in the Bible where gold, frankincense, and myrrh all come together in one place. Do you know where that is? Kids, do you know? It's in the temple. It's in the temple of God. Gold. If you went into the tabernacle, the tent, prior to the coming of the temple, inside everything's covered with gold. There's wood paneling inside covered with gold. All the implements and elements of the temple and the tabernacle are covered over or made of pure gold. You've got the altar of incense by the entrance to the holy place. It's covered with gold. You've got the golden lampstand made out of gold. You've got the table of showbread covered over with gold. You go into the Holy of Holies and there you find the Ark of the Covenant covered over with gold. And on top of it, the mercy seat with the angels Resting on top of that solid gold. Everything is gold inside the tabernacle and later the temple. Frankincense. In Exodus 30, verse 34, it says this. The Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stakke, onica, 
and Kabbalah, sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each there shall be an equal part, and make an incense, blended as with the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small, and put it before the testimony in the tent of meeting, where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. If you look at the Old Testament, you'll see that this incense goes into the altar of incense that blocks the way of going into the Holy of Holies, rising up as it's lit, always perpetually going up before God is the smoke of this incense. Why? These are the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. Riding up, as it were, on this incense that's made out of frankincense. In addition to this, every single grain offering has to be accompanied by this very same incense. The bread that's on the table of showbread has this incense on it. It becomes, as it were, bread from heaven. What about myrrh? Well, in verse 22 of Exodus 30, we see that you're to take liquid myrrh, and you're to do this with it in verse 25. You shall make of these sacred anointing oil blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony and the table and all its utensils and the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering and all of its utensils and its basin and its stand. Everything that's inside the temple you anoint with a special oil that has myrrh as its most common element. You shall use this. The altar of burnt offering and with the utensils and its basins you shall consecrate them that they may be most holy Whatever touches them will become holy. Now notice what happens next here. In verse 30, you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. So myrrh used in this holy anointing oil. Whatever this oil touches becomes holy. Whether it be the implements and the inanimate objects inside the temple or the priests themselves. Whoever is touched by this holy oil of myrrh becomes holy Gold, frankincense, myrrh find their common residence in the temple. And why is this important? John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Now, I don't believe that the wise men understood the import of what they were doing. They were merely bringing great gifts. And yet in God's providence, they're bringing specific gifts. They are consecrating the cornerstone of the temple that is to come. The Lord Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the true and new temple, and you are stones within it. These wise men here are bringing gifts to prepare the way for the New Testament, New Covenant temple, the body of Christ, the people of God. Jesus is the temple. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh are there to furnish that temple. Going on to verse 12. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. God speaks to these unknown magi and protects them as well as Jesus. And friends, guess what? You see what they do? They bring their gifts. They put their lives on the line. They take a long road trip. They come to Jesus. They bow down. They worship him. Those look like believers to me. Friends, on the last day, they will stand with us. We will spend eternity with these unknown magi who are protected by God from the machinations of Herod. This is the first epiphany. What we're looking at here is the epiphany of the Lord Jesus Christ. The epiphany, the appearing or the revealing of Jesus to the nations. Here we have representatives of Gentile kings, the nations who for so long have been kept from God's presence. But with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the nations are brought near. And these are the first fruits of the nations being brought in. Jesus is revealed as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the nations have come to Messiah after the long road back. The Vokevandrung, or Great Migration Period, was an era of entire people groups migrating over vast expanses of territory. 
It began about 300 AD as Germanic tribes were driven from the plains on the fringe of Asia and Europe by the steadily encroaching Huns. On the long road to new settlement, thousands of miles and hundreds of years away, by 700 AD, 400 years later, the entire world had changed with Germanic tribes from the Asian frontier now settled in Spain and North Africa with the Vandals and the Visigoths, the Franks in what would become France, and the Angles and Saxons in what would become England. England. It was a long, slow road to the modern world. It was a long, slow road for the Gentile nations to be brought near to God again. The first fruits are these wise men in our text this morning. But we live in the midst of the greatest of Volkerwanderungs, as entire nations and empires are migrating back into the presence of God because of his grace through the Lord Jesus Christ, as we sing with the long road back. So, Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to see once again the Lord Jesus revealed as King of kings and Lord of lords over the nations. We pray that you would encourage us by this. We pray that you would strengthen us by the power of the Holy Spirit to go forth from this place this day and to tell our neighbors and our friends and those we meet that Jesus is Lord. Draw them into the body of Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we've heard from the Lord through his word. Let us respond back with our tithes and offerings, our tribute to the king.
Please rise, hands up, brave, sing the duck song. <laughs> to bless all the saints this morning in the nation of Lebanon. The land has a large Christian population, but it is being slowly eroded by conflict with Islam and immigration. We pray that you'd bless the Christian church there and cause it to flourish. May you cause your people there to be filled with the love of Christ and honor for your word, and may you draw many Muslims into the faith through their example. Bless the ancient Orthodox and Roman Catholic communions of Lebanon and cause their faith to be more about Jesus than politics, ethnicity, and tradition. Please bless the National Evangelical Church of Beirut. May you grow and flourish these congregations and cause them to stand firm upon your word in a challenging place. May Lebanon be blessed to be once again a fully Christian nation. Heavenly Father, may our nation experience an epiphany of your son. Bring an epiphany of your son to the church in our land that we may know and bow the knee to King Jesus and honor, believe, and obey his word. Bring an epiphany of your son to our institutions that marriage may be biblical and sacred, and that the family may be strengthened and not fractured through sin and the rejection of your order. Bring an epiphany of your son to our government, that it may be just, uncorrupted, and humble under the true king. Bring an epiphany of your son to our schools, that they would turn and increasingly teach our children that this is King Jesus' world, and that we live and breathe and have our being in you. Bless our president, governor, legislators, and judges, that they might know you and fear you and give your people peace. Bless the Cardis as they assist Atherton's mother in this final stage of life. Please heal Reverend Jim Jordan from his stroke. Please heal and cheer Rab Rob Maddox in the midst of cancer. Bless and grow the CREC Church in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Bless and flourish the churches of Anselm Presbytery, Bless the CREC church plant in Pleasanton, California, that they would grow and mature. Bless us here in Santa Clarita and at Christ Church. Bless the church across denominational lines to be revived and united. Bless the SCB Pregnancy Center, and may our valley be an oasis of life. Cause Christian education to flourish and transform our city. Raise up godly fathers and mothers in our community to teach their children your word. Continue to form us as warriors of worship and song. Make us missionaries in our neighborhoods and workplaces and bless us to build a cathedral in Santa Clarita. Make our marriages strong and inflexible to our culture's foolish and easy answers. Please continue to heal and strengthen Marnie Allen. Keep Jandy Hardesty and her baby safe and healthy. Bless the Rodine family, and may you cause them to flourish in every way. Bless our singles with spouses. Heal the sick among us and lift up the brokenhearted. Make us fruitful with children at Christ Church, and may our children never remember a day they did not know you. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and with hands up raised, we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Today we celebrate Epiphany, the revealing of the Lord Jesus. We see Jesus. We have Gentiles, wise men, who come to the Lord Jesus and present gifts to him. And here we come to this table, this table where we see and taste the Lord Jesus Christ. A table at which we Gentiles, maybe not such wise men, come to the Lord Jesus. And yet at this Epiphany table, we don't bring our gifts, but he gives us of his body and his blood and we are blessed. We are those nations. We are the, the harvest that is coming in and continues to come in that was at that first fruits there. 
so many years ago. Who may come to this table, this table of thanksgiving, this table of revealing? If you've been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, if you're not under dis discipline by any Christian body, then we welcome you to this table. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks. Let us give thanks for the bread, the body of Christ. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for the revealing of your Son, for the giving of your Son, for the complete work on the cross and in the empty grave. We thank you for his body broken on our behalf, that we might be whole, your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as my memorial. As the bread's being passed, we're going to sing hymn number 112. same way he took the cup after supper and he gave thanks let us give thanks for the blood of Christ our father we thank you that we have forgiveness of sins not of our own doing but because Jesus Christ split blood his uh, spread his precious blood upon the cross so that we might be forgiven and made white as snow we thank you in Jesus name amen and he took the cup and he said this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it as my memorial and as the trays are being passed Turn to one another and pass peace.
That was the word I was looking for. It's a real hard one to come up with sometimes. Oh, sorry, I'm He's a crazy with you. Oh. blood of Christ that washes away all our sins. Take and drink. Please stand as we sing together hymn number 182, the Song of Simeon. Hymn number 182. Let us lift our voices saying, Make known your glory. 
You came among us to usher in your kingdom of peace. Make known your glory. O Lord, encompassed in light as with a cloak, you conquer the darkness of our night. Make known your glory. O bread eternal, you feed the hunger of your people in desert places. Make known your glory. You change our vessels of water into the gladdening wine of new life. Make known your glory. You are the true king of the nations, welcoming sinners into your kingdom. Make known your glory, which you share with the Father and the Spirit forever. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing together hymn number 12, God Rest Ye Merry, Gentlemen, hymn number 12. <laughs>
charge for the week from the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. With heads up, raise like good warriors of the cross, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace. Oh.